Hi, welcome to day two of the inaugural uh, CRC Time Annual Forum, and more specifically, the Risk Evaluation and Planning Session. I'm Brian Maybe. I'm the Program Lead for Risk Evaluation and Planning in CRC Time, and I am here on Wajik Country in the Noongar Nation. Uh, and we'd actually like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work, and we pay our respects to elders both past and present. Now, just before we begin with our first talk, I want to remind everyone to please use the live Q&A button for questions, and we will attempt to answer those questions following the presentations where possible. The general discussion forum is for interaction uh, during the, the sessions, and the questions that are posted there will not be monitored. So just a reminder. Now, as mentioned yesterday, we will be following this session with uh, two workshops uh, in uh, after break. So I do encourage you to attend one of those workshops and participate in the exciting discussions uh, that's framing our future research in this area. Now, with that said, uh, our first speaker is Aidan Davey from the uh, International Council on Mining and Metals. And while Aidan is unable to join us in person today, I did manage to catch up with him for a pre-recorded interview, which we'll uh, play now. Good morning. Joining me today is Aidan Davey, Chief Operating Officer of the International Council on Mining and Metal. Aidan joined ICMM in June 2007. As Chief Operating Officer, he is responsible for strategy development and implementation and leads the work to develop ICMM's mining principles, which define good practice environmental, social, and governance requirements for the mining and metals industry. He also leads ICMM's work on environmental issues, including the management of issues relating to biodiversity, climate change, mine closure, tailings, and water. Prior to assuming the role of Chief Operating Officer in 2015, Aiden led ICMM's work on social and economic development, investor engagement, and sustainability reporting. Thank you for taking the time to join me today, Aiden, to speak about uh, why it is important that we uh, change the way that we plan mines. Um, if I could, just to start with, ask you um, why the ICMM uh, has been so active in working on mine closure. Sure, and Brian, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this important conversation. Uh, so I guess you know, mine closure has was really one of the first priority areas that ICMM developed guidance on, and this is way back in the mid 2000s when we put out some publications on, on financial assurance for mine closure. And then in 2008, we launched the first edition of the Planning for Integrated Mine Closure Toolkit. So closure has been very much a constant in our lives really at ICMM. Then we fast forward to say 2014-15 and the economic downturn really brought increased attention to closure as we saw the economic viability of many mines being, being, being threatened due to dramatic falls in metals and minerals prices. And so you know, that increased focus on closure caused members to look back at what we put out in 2008 and say, do we really need to update that? Is it fit for purpose? And that then led to the launch of the second edition of the Integrated Mine Closure Good Practice Guide in 2019. And we developed many additional resources to support the industry in implementing responsible closure practices since that time. And so that includes our work on financial concepts for mine closure and our closure maturity framework that's really designed to to help individual companies map and motivate and, and measure really the status uh, of their individual assets on the journey to sustainable closure. So that's really, I guess, what got us into this area and what sustains our interest in, in mine closure. So, so why do you think it's important that uh, mine closure plans actually now be integrated with production plans? So I, th I think it, really there's a few fundamental drivers at play here, I think, Brian. You know, firstly, I think there's a, there's a growing appreciation among regulators and companies that if host countries and host communities are really going to support new mining projects coming on stream, they've got to have confidence that those mines will eventually be responsibly closed. 
And that confidence is, is undermined by the historical legacy of poor practices in our sector. So if mining is going to continue to play a significant role in the economic life of either countries or regions, that means we've got to pay close attention to integrated closure. Secondly, I think that shift is occurring because you know, regulators are increasingly conscious of the many benefits of adopting an early and integrated approach to planning for mine closure. Uh, and that includes the improved environmental outcomes that integrated closure can bring in situations where mines might need to close early. And thirdly, because because regulators and companies are recognizing that if you bring close, closure considerations to the fore earlier in an integrated manner, that means you can plan, implement and achieve sustainable outcomes that are beneficial, not just for mining companies and their employees, but for the wider environment and those communities. So, so I think these really are the, the, the factors that are coalescing to drive that closure integration of, of mine closure and mine production in the minds of regulators. And think about it from a almost a design point of view. How does this impact the way that we design our minds and plan them? What is in that regard? So, so I think it it impacts you know you know in a, in a really practical way uh, on how we design for closure throughout the life of an asset. And you know I think just just some of the kind of practical approaches that we we see companies adopting include you know say making some of the areas available for progressive closure so that we, we limit closure impacts and liability at final closure. So, so doing it as you go along. I think we're also seeing some companies sequencing the, the stripping and storage of topsoil during development that facilitates that being directly placed in areas that are going to be reclaimed. Uh, and you know, the upside of that is that it not just reduces haul distances, but it also preserves topsoil quality. We're seeing things like you know, the strategic placement of potentially reactive materials, and that's going to help facilitate their isolation and avoid knock on impacts such as groundwater contamination. And we're also seeing things like designing waste disposal facilities with long term physical stability, uh, you know, and, and maximized in pit dumping, minimizing closure earthworks at closure. So you know, those are just some of the kind of examples. And as, as we know, you know, best practice, I think, in this area requires that closure planning is done at the starting point of the mining operations, then periodically reviewed and revised throughout the life cycle. Um, but we're also starting to see a paradigm shift in the way that closure planning is being integrated into business decision making processes. And I think that's driving really novel thinking in terms of some of the op opportunities associated with mine closure. So that when we're, we're seeing closure being fully embedded into the life of mine planning or indeed production planning, it leads to better results as, as both the, the expectations and the risks and the opportunities can be proactively managed uh, and achieved for, for the mining company and, and for wider stakeholders. And, and just one example of this is you know, Anglo-American recently presented on their, their joint ownership model and how that centralized, integrated and multidisciplinary strategic planning approach that they've adopted has generated an excess of of seven hundred and fifty million dollars across their assets due to a reduction in risks and hence closure liabilities. Well, thank you. You talked a bit about how uh, uh, different parts of the planning process are affected and how integration of closure into those processes uh, would would happen. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what roles. Um, would typically involve be involved in this combined planning process that involves closure as well as other parts of the of the mining business. Sure, and 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 you know although the closure planning is a pretty well established discipline within the mining sector, but we we still you know still sometimes see that disconnect between good closure practices that are looked at in a holistic way that address environmental social impacts and, and reduce closure liabilities, and then the actual execution of closure uh, on the ground. So, you know, starts really with planning being a core business practice and being considered from the, des the design phase right through operation. And, and clearly, mine planning engineers play a fundamental role in ensuring that this occurs. Uh, but I think there's, there's an opportunity to realize significant environmental, social, and indeed business value where it's better integrated uh, into uh, mine planning processes. And that's going to take multidisciplinary buy in. Uh, and and so, you know, in the ICMM Integrated Mind Closure Toolkit, we identify some of those roles and responsibilities to get that multidisciplinary buy-in buy and engage in 
a combined planning process. And so we point to the need for, for a closure champion to really drive the development of the process. Uh, the importance of community liaison professionals who are going to engage with and facilitate stakeholder input, uh, or indeed professionals in the human resources space, and a whole range of technical expertise, you know, from, from mine engineering through to rehabilitation, geotech, water management, uh, biodiversity, and then finance as well. And all this really needs to be driven by, by senior leadership uh, and indeed aligned with the performance incentives of senior leadership in order to lessen the risks associated with competing internal priorities. Now, you talked about that uh, multidisciplinary buy-in as being one of the keys or one of the pieces needed to really integrate uh, those pieces. Um, are there other barriers that are being encountered by, by companies as they try to sort of integrate uh, closure within their planning processes? I, th I think there probably are, Brian, and, and you know, look, one of, one of the barriers really stems from the, the traditional limits to the role of mine planning. So I guess you know that the role of a mine planner at an operations to to you know, traditionally it's about identifying the potential value in a given mineral resource and providing a really practical and realistic you know optimal strategy for extracting that resource efficiently. So in many cases, mine planners don't necessarily have experience of closing mines. You know, is either a, a, a main goal or a secondary goal, uh, uh, because their main goal is all about maximizing resource extraction at the lowest possible cost. Then I think another barrier is that the current project evaluation tools tend to be focused, you know, on value generation, uh, and they don't effectively really reflect long term costs. And so those tools need to be adapted to consider long term liabilities beyond the traditional net present value approach, uh, and mm -hmm. and then. Thinking through well, what does that then mean for free cash flow? Um, in, in addition, I think you know integration within modeling is difficult as 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 mining and closure models don't always mesh with each other, uh, and and whereas the timeframes of mine clo mine planning tend to focus on kind of short, medium, and to some extent you know long term, it can often be difficult to get closure embedded into all of those, and then maybe lastly is as as with any business, you know, we know the plans change and that's very, very true of mining. And it may be down to fluctuations in, in commodity prices. It may be down to the profitability of the company, changing community expectations or, or indeed changing regulatory requirements. And so integrating these expectations can be quite challenging in the short term, while also trying to, trying to think about the long-term impacts of the mine. Uh, so I, I guess there's, there's a number of priorities that are really competing for management time and attention at a mine operation. So finding the sweet spot that really incorporates long-term thinking is, is challenging, but it's imperative. Mm, yeah, no, that's, that's very, very insightful. And now if I could take you to that next level up in the business to the board of directors level, from that perspective, uh, why is it important for the business, for the mining business then to change sort of the way that we plan our mines for the future? Yeah, I think it's important because you know a, a balanced approach to to closure that that fully uh, you know fully in, that's fully incorporated into mine planning activities is going to lead to better outcomes across a range of of factors you know and health factors, safety factors, social factors, environmental, legal, governance, and indeed human resource factors. Um, and, and I think we see you know, truly effective integration of closure planning leading to a diverse range of benefits. So improved stakeholder support for closure and business decision making. We see it leading to, to better management of closure throughout the, the mining life cycle, better closure cost estimates, which, as you know very well, become critically important uh, the closer you get to the point of closure. Um, it, it, certainly supports early identification of risks and, and mitigation strategies, um, supports progressive reduction of liabilities, which again, I think is an increasingly material consideration for, for, for mining companies. And uh, it also helps you to identify opportunities for lasting benefits uh, and, and not just identify those, but, but, but plan for those so that you realize those. And all of those really combined uh, make these, I think, really important to take that kind of long-term perspective. Oh, it's very, very good. Thank you. Uh, look, 
so a lot to think about there uh, for us to think about. And I just uh, maybe in closing, I might ask you, um, what are a couple of the key factors or key things that you think could be done to or improved upon to assist in the integration of closure planning into mine planning as we move forward with this and we move uh, forward for future mines? Yeah, I guess I guess maybe one of the most important factors is is recognizing the the, the risk, perhaps of 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 not getting this right. So so at its most basic, if you fail to adopt an integrated approach to mine closure, you're going to lose out on all those benefits that we've kind of talked about uh, already in this conversation, Brian. So if you're going to avoid that, we've really got to make sure that we have the right systems and processes in place that allow us to integrate multi-criteria evaluation approaches in, into all decision-making. And, and I guess you know, all that in turn is supported by establishing the accountability of, of senior leadership while ensuring that the processes are implemented that, that really help to hardwire multidisciplinary thinking and collaboration into planning processes over both the short and the long term. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's given us a lot to think about, and um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. It's been my pleasure. Brian, thanks for the opportunity. Great to talk. That was uh, Aidan Davey from the ICMM speaking about why it is important to change the way that we plan our minds. Now, I'm going to introduce our uh, keynote uh, speaker for this, this session. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kayleen Gulich. Uh, Kayleen commenced as the Chief Executive Officer of the West Australian Treasury Corporation in February of 2019. She has extensive experience in public policy, knowledge of financial markets, and expertise in the Western Australian economy. She has previously held senior roles within the Department of Treasury as both the Executive Director of the Economic Business Unit and the Executive Director for Infrastructure and Finance, as well as being a member of CPA Australia and the AICD. Ms. Gulich has previously been a director with Gold Corporation and a member of their Audit and Risk Committee. She has previously held the Deputy Chairperson position on West Australia Tre Treasury Corporation's board and is currently a director on Venues West board and holds the position as treasurer for IPAAWA. Ms. Gulich was awarded a Public Service Medal in the June 2021 Queen's Birthday Honours for outstanding public service to Western Australia through a range of roles. So I'd like to uh, ask you to please welcome uh, Kayleen to the stage. She's going to speak to us about ESG trends in financial markets. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I've got to work on shortening that bio. Apologies for that, everyone. Uh, I'm going to very quickly step through about eight slides this morning with yourselves on some of the, the broad trends that I've seen in financial markets, and I'm seeing them on behalf of the government, given the, the issuance program we have of raising funds to support the state objectives. But more broadly, the trends that I've seen, uh, we're seeing replicated in commercial finance and project finance. So they hopefully will be of interest to yourselves what I'm seeing broadly is what I've described as a mega trend. So financial markets are increasingly mobilising to impact with their investment dollars. So investors are looking for returns on their dollars, but also they're looking to make sure that their dollars are being used for proceeds or outcomes that align to their own or their, their portfolio or their funds mandates. What we're finding is this is a continuation of trends we've seen over a number of years, but the acceleration has been quite stark in the last three to four years. So previously, we would see investors who would do predominantly negative screening. So they would stay away from coal or they'd stay away from tobacco, for example. What we're seeing instead now at the bottom of that graph is that they're actually integrating the environmental, social and governance outcomes into their, their um, portfolio decisions. And what we're finding then is a, a bulk of funds are now looking to understand the ESG basis of the investment that they're making. So this has given rise to what we're calling the use of proceeds bonds. And so this is where the lending of money is linked directly to a project outcome and therefore to the social out or, or um, environmental outcomes that that project delivers. Now, this is reasonably new in government funding uh, and you've seen the rapid rise there in terms of US billions you know, of funds under management that have now been attributed to this use of proceeds. 
What it does for a government perspective is it particularly links certain projects to the funding source. It significantly increases the reporting we have to do on those projects and those initiatives. But against that, it actually assists us in broadening our access to markets and our available funding pool, which is very important when we're, our primary objective is both access to funds and the price of those funds. So there's a couple of reasons why we've seen this trend accelerate and continue to accelerate both in the government and the financial markets perspective. And it, it's across the multiple fronts. And I think what we're seeing is it's that continuation of the triple bottom line approach to business. And so this is where investors and investment managers are increasingly looking at where the physical and integration risk exists in the business. And there's some really good statistics out there about the average lifespan of a business now. And it's considerably lower than it was 10 or 20 years ago. And so looking through a triple bottom line or an ESG lens into a business helps investors to have a feel of what is the risk profile of that business, what's the responsiveness of that business to these large trends that they're exposed, and therefore have a feel for how sustainable is that business. So the investor is looking for that long-term sustainability. They're looking to align, uh, see where sustainability aligns with the goals of the business. And this is that traditional tension between immediate profits and long-term profits. And so the longer term profits and the more focus on ES and G outcomes, the more likely the business is to be sustainable and profitable over a longer period without some of those tail issues we see in businesses in that declining quadrant of their, their life cycle. Uh, as I said, the other component is new investors. So investors from non-traditional backgrounds looking to raise a return for their funds. And that's particularly relevant at the moment, given we're in such a low interest rate environment, that investors are still looking for that pickup. And so they'll come into non-traditional types of assets, but in doing so, they might bring their, their more um, conservative risk or investment management practices. And um, superannuation funds is a really good example of that and a growing example of investment opportunity, but also mobilised investments investors where they're looking to achieve outcomes beyond just the return. There's also the alignment with regulatory and industry expectations and shareholder expectations. And I don't want to underestimate the impact these are having. And so what we're seeing is a broadening trend in terms of environmental, social and governance being felt in the boardroom, being felt by the finance industry, being felt by the mobilised um, activists that uh, we, we often see uh, protesting in the streets. So these trends are all starting to come together. And what we're finding is it's, traditionally, it's impacting even non-traditional investors. And so, again, going back to this rise, this steep rise we're seeing in, in impact investment, uh, expecting to see that continue into 21 and beyond. What is interesting for me is this is a broadening trend uh, beyond those elements I spoke to with the shareholders and the, the activists. But what we're finding now is regulators are increasingly coming active in this space around ES and G outcomes. And so we're seeing the accounting agencies, accounting frameworks now shifting to include um, disclosure, climate related disclosure in particular. We've got the Reserve Bank being part of initiatives around sort of greening the financial system. We've got the national regulator. We've got the rating agencies particularly active in terms of having explicit ESG scores. Uh, and Moody's and S&Ps are both looking um, to increase and enhance their capability in this space. And so what we're finding is regulators are tightening that definition and oversight around what is meant by an ESG outcome. And this is particularly to give confidence that when an, ent an entity is claiming an ESG outcome, and when they're issuing funds or raising funds under an ESG framework, that we're actually delivering on what we intend. And this comes down to that, that um, the commentary around greenwashing and an intent to avoid that. Um, so what was considered a, a green or social outcome two or three or five years ago may not hit the bar now, and certainly wouldn't hit the bar in two or five years time, such as the trend and the tightening of the regulatory environment. So there's a lot of detail, and this is one of the challenges when you start wading into this space of just the proliferation of guidance and frameworks. Uh, and this is partly because it has risen so quickly. And what's happening is regulators around the world are, are still scrambling to, to come together and actually work out what is the, the common language, what's the common reporting requirements, what's the, the common um, approach and outcomes to be sought. And so we are starting to see some consolidation in these guidelines and disclosure requirements. But we're also then starting to see a proliferation of industry specific outcomes. And I've got a couple down the bottom there in the mining space that some of you would be aware of. Um, and what I, what I find is these are intended to help in the first instance, 
but as this, this space matures and becomes embedded in both the financial and business decisions of all sectors, you'll see some consolidation in these principles as we, we get greater clarity of what it is we're actually required to do to meet those financing ESG outcomes. Um, I think if I can just reiterate the, the pace of this change and the momentum that's behind it, so I did a bit of a, a scan in the last fortnight of large public media announcements, and obviously we've had COP26, so there's been a lot in the news. But what we're finding is at a, a sovereign investor and business perspective, businesses are increasingly driving different types of business decisions to particularly achieve environmental outcomes. And this is partly because the businesses have set themselves up as a competitive position to try and actually achieve environmental outcomes. Partly it will be because of their access to finance and part of it will be because of that momentum I spoke to from multiple fronts actually driving them to achieve uh, different outcomes. And so we've seen that shift into EVs, we've seen business diversification through particularly our big mining entities, we've seen um, uh, uh, super funds being more active in their disclosure and actually significantly increase their reporting requirements to demonstrate the, the carbon offset that they're achieving. And then we've seen some really large changes out through uh, sovereign powers such as China, which are really looking to shift up their energy use and their energy composition, which is a large part of the decarbonisation discussion. So one of the, the um, components I'd, I'd pause here on is that Western Australia and indeed Australia more generally does have a perception issue and we've seen again this play out through the COP26 discussions and just the, the long-standing disputes at the national level of what is climate change and what is the country's response and so we are seeing a number of instances where particularly international investors are warned off or hesitant to invest in Australian in sovereigns and semi-sovereigns and through that into Australian businesses so there's a, a large element of actually addressing these real and perceived elements and demonstrating from a business perspective or from a government perspective, the genuine elements of ESG outcomes that we deliver and are intending to deliver on and the genuine targets that we do have in place. So just a quick plug here to assist with managing that perception issue, we have released in the last fortnight an ESG information pack, which works through using the UN Sustainability Development Goals and demonstrates a breadth of activity uh, commitments and um, projects and programs that the state government is, has underway and a number of targets the state government has in place to support ESG profiling of the state. And the intent in doing this is to support an eventual issuance of a, a green or sustainable bond and is also intended to support understanding in our investment network more broadly of what WA stands for and what it is that we actually deliver on because it's important that not only am I able to issue a sustainable bond, but that I'm also able to refinance the, the 50 plus billion dollars of debt that we, we turn over every couple of years. And so the feeling with the information pack was really getting to the heart of what investors want to know and then providing real and timely information to them to support ongoing understanding and to demonstrate the genuineness of the WA government in committing towards these outcomes. So that's where I'm going to pause. I have been exceptionally quick in the time frame that we do have, but if I can sum it up, we've, we've got a mega trend, financial markets colliding with rating agencies, colliding with regulators, colliding with public expectation and shareholder pressure. And that's considerably driving different types of business decisions um, now than we would have seen two or five years ago, and will shift uh, business decisions into the future as well. And it's about understanding how, what those decisions are, how they drive and support sustainability of the business, and then importantly, how they're communicated to that external environment to demonstrate that they are genuine and that they are intended to achieve good outcomes. Thanks, Kayleen. That was a wonderful talk. Um, as I said, we have a few minutes available for questions. If anyone uh, has any, and I reiterate to please post them in the uh, live Q&A, and I can pick up on them from there. Um, I might just ask a one while we're, we're waiting here to pick up a bit on the social side of bonds and of investing uh, versus um, the environmental. The two are linked, of, of course, there is a link. And I was wondering if you might comment a bit on 
we all know no climate change as a social and environmental issue is is very powerful. But beyond that, what are some of the other social issues, I guess, that are that investors are are key social issues that investors are are very in tune with, I guess, or interested in at this point? Yeah. Um, I think the heart of it would be access to equality. So from a government perspective, education equality, gender equality, diversification of opportunity. Um, they're looking to see where we're assisting those of the, the least advantage to progress through the, 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 the spectrum of advantage. And that's particularly relevant, I think, for mining companies that do look to partner with the local community, look to achieve social outcomes of livability, um, wealth and um, I guess educational attainment and, and workforce attainment. So they're the, they're the big ones. Uh, if you go back to, I can't, don't know if I can go back, but the SDG goals that are on the screen there, the reason we chose them to represent what the state does is because of that really large delivery or focus on social outcomes. So the state spends roughly 60% of our $60 billion a year on achieving its social outcomes and a large portion. That's all right. Um, the UN Sustainability Goals, and as I said, we spend a large portion trying to um, deliver health and social outcomes and housing outcomes for the broad community, but also a large portion of that for those most disadvantaged. And I think that's where investors really want to see the uplift of where uh, dollars are spent to achieve a better outcome than would otherwise have been in place. All right. Uh, look, we have a, a couple of questions coming through. Uh, one of them is, um, I guess, is it expected that uh, government will also monitor ESG claims made by entities operating uh, in WA who make claims to these ESG credentials? Is that uh... No, I, I don't think government will monitor it unless they, they trip over into any of our space of being a regulator. regulator. I think what will happen is the, the community more broadly will monitor it. So your financier, if you're making those claims, your shareholders, the activists in your industry will certainly hold you to account. And we've seen that if you if you make a statement and you haven't quite articulated properly what you mean by it, it's very quick to make claims around greenwashing and, 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 and such. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, also, question, could you talk a little more on the top actions, I guess, in the WA government's ESG info pack? Um, yes, so the info pack, uh, we've done it, um, a couple of key points. We focus first on governance because we think governance is at the heart of what should give investors and business partners to the WA government confidence that what the government says they will do, they will do. So high level of transparency, high level of economic and fiscal capacity and the architecture that sits around that that ensures that when we make a commitment publicly, we've got parliamentary scrutiny, the media scrutiny and then the, the governance through the Auditor General and the other compliance bodies to ensure we deliver on that. From there, we spend a lot more time focusing on the environmental outcomes, given that's where some of the credibility issues remain in WA. And a large portion of that is looking at our carbon transition plans. So the state's commitment to zero, net zero by 2050. And then some of the enablers that are actually in place that should work to mean that the government has, with industry, a large number of the tools available to actually shift very quickly down that path of zero zero um, emissions and then also the government's acknowledgement of the need for interim targets and the work being done on that at the moment and then lastly the third section is around the social outcomes and articulating that WA is a very lucky jurisdiction in terms of the place to live work and invest but beyond that what are some of the initiatives the state's spending around that disadvantage the the final section is a appendice where we against all 17 goals we have roughly two pages of works in progress or initiatives in progress that shows just at the, the granular level types of initiatives the government's doing to achieve outcomes against all 17 areas. And, and one last question, perhaps if I if we could came through, um, thinking a bit, I guess, into the future. In the next 10 years, uh, do you think it's possible for companies or other actors uh, to be asked to show through some sort of metrics and indicators how they contribute to the WA goals under the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, whether it be economic, yeah. social groups, et cetera. I think so. And I think this is where these sort of presentations are really important because WA government sitting here, business working in WA sitting here, and this is the same for any businesses around the country working with their jurisdiction. 
investors often won't distinguish between the, the achievements of one and the other. So the extent that we demonstrate where we're in partner, where the state's using its capabilities and its role to support and sponsor business to achieve ESG outcomes and vice versa is really important. We won't achieve zero emission only by business or only by the state going against it, going for it. So that integration is going to increasingly be important. What it looks like in terms of the reporting requirements and then the, the, the who's driving what, I'm not sure. But I think that I'm safe to say that it's going to evolve very quickly. Well, thank you. And I think I'll hold that there and say thank you very much for your time for a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, it is an ESG area is one that is very important uh, in many sectors, and mining is is no no uh, is one of those sectors in which it is very important and a sector that's very important to WA. So, thank you very much for a very topical presentation. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. So, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, so that was, there were a couple of, of interesting talks there that, that really introduced the landscape uh, that we are working within and what the risk uh, evaluation and planning program within the CRC uh, has been developed to do is it's been developed with the vision to improve decision making processes across the life of a mine. Uh, again, with the specific focus, of course, on the optimization of cost-effective and successful closure and relinquishment. Now, this vision was in response to the recognition that <clears throat> the business case for responsible closure and relinquishment is an extremely difficult business case to quantify, as there tends to be <clears throat> a lack of capacity for integrated uh, long-term uh, risk assessment. We use traditional valuation models uh, that lead to suboptimal decisions and unfunded liabilities. There's a lack of transparency and uniformity in the assessment of closure costs and liabilities. And there is a limited understanding of what an acceptable level of residual of residual risk is. And, and we heard these sort of things talked about um, by, by Aiden and, and Kayleen in, in their, their, their presentations. Thus far, this vision has been advanced through uh, the portfolio of foundational projects that we are have been undertaking. Um, and I'm gonna actually now ask the, the uh, project leads for each of those foundational projects that are related to the risk uh, evaluation and planning program to provide a brief overview and update on uh, where they've got to, uh, where the projects are at. Now, these projects include uh, looking at understanding stakeholder values in post money economies and uh, Tira Foran, who is a, a senior research scientist in the water security program at, at uh, CSIRO Land and Water, is going to talk up to that. Then we'll have uh, Isaac, Isaac Zapata, who's a work area leader for integrated mine planning at Mining 3, discuss the project around exploring the issues in mine closure planning. Um, Eric Wilford, who's an associate professor of minerals and energy economics at Curtin University's WA School of Mines and industry consultant, will talk about the current tools, techniques, and gaps that we see in evaluating mine closure. And then Ed Holloway, who is um, um, sorry, a director and principal consultant at uh, Quantified Strategies, will talk about quantifying risks and opportunities from uh, mine closure. So uh, as we're, we are tight on time in this session, without further delay, I will pass to uh, Tira Foran. It's Tira Foran. It's my pleasure to introduce or reintroduce Research Project 2.1 on behalf of the team. Let me expand the slides and continue. So this is a tri-state all-star team of researchers featuring Marcus Barber, Fran Ackerman, Kelly Schmidt, Fiona Haslam McKenzie, Brian Maybe, and Tom Meesham. 
So the research project runs until June of 2022. What are values? Values are what matters to you. What is of concern? Enduring conceptions of Okay, enduring conceptions of what is good. I apologize that the slides are not appearing. Um, I need to share a separate screen, perhaps. I'm just adjusting the slides. Let's see, I hope that's better. Okay, so I've just uh, given a couple of definitions of what values are. Things get more interesting when we think of values as what arguably should matter to political representatives or to corporations. This suggests that values are a basic and everyday element to our social life, not just labels or categories of things we pick up. Because the values associated with mind land involve the interplay of public and private goods, it's appropriate and necessary that they should be discussed, debated and argued over. So in terms of the project components, there's a review of literature on value from multiple disciplinary perspectives. That's been completed. We're undertaking now field work, field-based interviews, then which will be followed by uh, workshops or focus groups in three regions. Whose values do we seek to understand? Well, the initial focus is on six categories of stakeholders recognized by CRC time. Uh, those are the six stakeholder colleges, mining companies, indigenous traditional owners, government agencies, non-indigenous community representatives, and the MET sector, and then finally researchers. In terms of our methods, so interviews are ongoing in three case study areas. So there's the bauxite mine closure in Yongu country in Nalanboy, coal mine closure in Nungar country, in Kali, the coal mines of Gurnai Kurnai country in Latrobe Valley, Victoria. Which values are we interested in eliciting? Well, there's a focus in these interviews and on the on the this component of the project on the best possible outcomes as the interviewee sees it for a region after mine closure. In terms of our analysis, we identify specific key concerns that our interview respondents express. We establish relations between specific concerns. We do this based on a set of questions that ask the respondent to summarize the history of mining and its effects on a region, the best possible outcome as the respondent sees it, the best possible outcome for two other stakeholders as the respondent sees it, and so on. We then construct a coherent set of accounts from individual and collective responses to these questions. In terms of classifying values, there already exist various typologies or ways to classify environmental values and the values that humans hold across diverse cultures. But the values associated with mine closure and post mining development don't fall neatly into these existing classifications. In addition, values can be classified according to how deeply held or how salient they are. In terms of identifying questions for further research, Brian has laid out a research agenda just now in the spirit of optimizing the decision-making of mining companies from a perspective that seeks to reframe the decision problem according to alternative evaluation metrics or criteria. But in addition to that ex-ante research agenda, governments and licensees are already negotiating closure now in regions such as Kali and in the Latrobe Valley. In such situations, what practically can be done to secure and deliver a bundle of what matters or arguably should matter to stakeholders of regions? So the final report will be complete in mid 2022. Following this session, there will be a workshop for this project. The objectives of the workshop are to invite you as CRC time forum participants to share some critical values you hold with respect to transitions in mining economies to discuss how do these critical or key values align or diverge? 
what should be considered when attempting to realize them, and how an understanding of values obtained or contributed through this project might inform CRC Time's ongoing 2021 to 2024 research agenda. So that workshop will be immediately after the tea break following this session. Thank you. Everyone. Hi everyone, microphone issues there. Um, so I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, the project team that looked at um, mind closure planning issues. And the team was uh, Mohamed Karechi, um, Mehmet Kizil, as well as Brian Maybe, uh, as shown on the screen. So what we did was to explore um, fundamentally what issues were plaguing um, mind closure planning, uh, not only from an internal perspective, but from an environmental perspective where you're looking at the people who do the mind closure planning, uh, but as well as people who receive the output of mind closure plans or mind closure uh, planning activity as, as an output. Um, so what you see on your screen is sort of expressing that view that there are multiple agents playing in the activity of mind planning, uh, but this part of the work actually focused on the internal part of the stakeholders. So we look at the mine operator, um, the state regulator, as well as um, the state agencies that play into the planning process. Uh, the first thing we did was to do a very uh, snap literature review, and then that led us to some of the key issues that uh, we had to focus on. And then we conducted an industry con consultation uh, and, and some kind of survey, uh, not very detailed, but uh, enough to provide some further insights on how we should then do the analysis of, of the detailed literature work. Um, so we we used two methods uh, that provided uh, we 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 agreed provided a very sound um, approach to analyzing the issue. So we looked at uh, the sources or the suppliers of the elements that form part of the plan, and then we looked at the inputs themselves, uh, and then we then looked at the process, uh, and this helped us really to disintegrate the, the, the mind closure planning process uh, into different elements and look at where the issues are in terms of these five uh, components. And then we turn to the other side where we look at mind closure planning as a, as a complex system. So there is a source, there is a source that is transmitting or providing information to a receiver and there are channels by which we deliver that outcome. And so we looked at it in this sort of hybrid uh, complex system viewpoint where we then were able to speak to the key uh, stakeholders and then analyze some of the issues that we found. Um, we looked at it again, like I said, from two perspectives, mainly from the regulator side of things and the operator side of things. And we found um, some, some big issues, but I've just listed a couple of them here to, to provide um, a very quick uh, snapshot of what we found. Uh, so from the regulator side of things, we clearly saw that uh, the, the perspective was predominantly issues that related to over-reliance uh, on, on estimation methods and, and, and that saw a lot of uncertainty uh, and that suggested that there was some lack of understanding uh, on the major cost drivers uh, from the regulator point of view. Um, the other key finding from the regulator point of view um, was that uh, issues around um, the agency not being able to integrate um, the, the, the various information systems as, or knowledge-based systems um, that guide the mine closure planning process. And then finally, uh, the, the, the regulator side of things thought that the glove changing ownership of mines actually presented a huge problem 
where the mines change ownership over time or over its life cycle and therefore presented different challenges to different owners and the legacy issues were much difficult to, to deal with from a planning point of view. And when we look at the operator side of things, the mine operators uh, were more focused on the process uh, resource and technology integration. That's where some of the big issues were in terms of mine closure planning. And there are a couple of other things amidst the issue of having silo based uh, departments or teams that tend to work towards the process of planning uh, but do not communicate or are not integrated in terms of how they come up with uh, the, the, the mine closure plan as an output. Um, so in terms of next work, uh, we are beginning to step into the area where we're looking at bringing all of this together into a knowledge base uh, closure planning um, expert approach or toolkit uh, based on the framework that we developed in the first part of the work. Um, I'll just snap it here because we don't have much time, but uh, this shows you a very high level view of what we are thinking about. So one of the primary hypotheses we sort of came up with at the end of this work was to, was to say that uh, there were some disconnects really uh, in the way uh, mine closure planning was done from the uh, regulatory and the mine operator side of things. Uh, and therefore we would seek to use a case study workshop approach uh, to be able to uh, seek some interest from some of those stakeholders we spoke to earlier on, and then use that as a basis for developing a, a knowledge base approach um, uh, to, to be able to, to, to do mine closure planning uh, that enabled both sides to contribute and be able to track and, and see the outcomes of, of the mine closure process uh, in a very integrated way. Um, there's a stage gate to, to, to see if there was enough interest. And, and then once we have interest for that, we'll sort of carry on uh, to, to do the proof of concept and then finally test and validate uh, the framework. So thank you, welcome questions later on. Group looked at uh, this is project 2.3. Looked at the tools, techniques, and gaps that are currently existing um, within the industry to evaluate mine closure. So what we did is we surveyed a number of mining companies to get a, a better feel for exactly what it is that is uh, that's missing or what they're currently doing. So we focused on using a questionnaire and we we looked at um, values, costs, risks associated with mine closure, and then at those various practices and gaps. And what culminated. There are a number of key definitions that came up as being a requirement to hit on the head to start off with. So the results gave rise to a need to differentiate what is risk versus what is an uncertainty. And thereafter, to have a look explicitly at what is a tangible risk and tangible uncertainty versus an intangible risk and an intangible uncertainty. When we talk about tangibles and intangibles, you know, tangible risk would be what we would determine as a known known. So we know the risk we know the uncertainty. Um, an intangible risk is an unknown known. So the intangible part is unknown. The risk is known. And intangible uncertainty is the difficult one. That's an unknown unknown because we don't know what is intangible and we don't know what the uncertainty is. And then, of course, we've got the intangible. Oh, sorry, we've got the, the final one, which is the, um, the, the unknown known, which is therefore the um, intangible risk. So getting all those factors, and I've put a quick diagram up so you can see how we look at them. And there's obviously a relationship between a risk and uncertainty. Um, what we do know is that in terms of risks, and certainly the tangible risk, we've, so we've got rules and regulations that cover risks, that cover tangibles, but they tend to fall short around uncertainties and intangibles. That starts defining what the gap is in terms of what we are doing in evaluating mine closure, you know, the tools and techniques and the gaps. What comes out clearly through our work was that the social aspects are a challenge. Identifying the social components, and then of course quantifying the um, social components, and that can be the S part of ESG that we're talking about. As far as current tools are concerned, well, there seem to have been a significant number of practitioners who actually apply DCF NPV. One of the issues that certainly arose was then 
what is the science behind a discount rate when you talk about a net present value? So therein lies a significant amount of work that has to be done, especially when we talk about a pure weighted average cost of capital. And then we add on some intangible uncertainty risk factor. How do we go about doing that? What do we do? Of course, there's an overarching question that says that is a DCF NPV actually the appropriate tool um, to be using at all? So just to, to sum up very quickly, and this will lead into the next phase, largely around what we're going to do in the workshop, um, the breakaway coming across after tea, but also in terms of the work ahead as far as our group is concerned or the, the themes are concerned, we're looking at those gaps relating to ESG, identifying ESG and quantifying, and that currently is inadequate. We need to address a community, the social aspect, and what are those future needs and requirements as far as communities are concerned? Discounting factors I mentioned, and then of course determination, which is identification in the first instance, and secondly, to quantify intangible values, which will be liabilities and assets. Keep in mind that a value is not necessarily a positive, it could also be on the negative front. So that takes us into the next phase of, of work that we are going to be doing. And on that uh, happy note, I'll pass back. I'm complete. Pass on. Okay. All right. My turn. Uh, I'm going. We've done quite a bit of work under Project Two Point Four, so I'm going to motor through this uh, fairly quickly to try and keep us on time. Um, we're just going to present a subset of what's been done. So uh, let's get right on with that. Okay, so just start with a quick overview of the project objective. What we're trying to do is incorporate operational domain design into the strategic planning framework. So instead of that being essentially a parallelised work program or something that's done on a post hoc basis, we're trying to actually incorporate it within the one framework. Uh, and we want to consider risk and we're going to do that using probabilistic inputs. Uh, we also want the framework to be flexible so that it's not a, a single use tool. We want to be able to consider other risks at a future point in time if we, uh, if we so desire. There's obviously a team working on this, uh, and I, I suppose the main comment I'd made here is that the level of collaboration was uh, was fantastic between the different technical disciplines and the different institutions. It worked really well. We had a couple of curveballs in there. Never happens in research, but uh, yeah, it's it's worked really well. Uh, so the approach to the research that we took was we've we've run it through a case study. Uh, the idea being that talking about a hypothesis would carry less impact than if we actually demonstrated it through a case study. So what we did was we selected the case study and then we identified the operational domain design that we wanted to look at. In this case, it was a waste dump. Uh, we then identified the design and risk-based criteria that we wanted to look at. We ran scenarios and we analysed those and then quantified the risks as a function of both the strategy and that operational domain design. A quick overview of the case study, it's a tier one copper gold operation. It's an open pit, it's in a tropical mountainous region, high rainfall and it's seismically active. So it's a tough place to build a dump uh, and have a high degree of confidence that it'll be stable, mostly due to the fact that a lot of the inputs, are, it's hard to have a high degree of confidence around any of them really. Uh, so the overview of what we looked at in terms of the scenarios from the geotech side, we looked at including or excluding groundwater impact, including and excluding seismic, and we ran two different types of probabilistic models being Bishop and Janbu. On the groundwater scenarios, we looked at the hydraulic conductivity of the face, the dump core and the drains. What we're trying to do with that is identify where the phreatic surface is going to sit as an input into the geotech scenarios. So those groundwater scenarios are again probabilistic. And on the mining and commercial side, uh, we've looked at a range of different ultimate pit sizes and scales, and we've looked at a range of operating commodity price ranges. So we're not trying to just flip over and all of a sudden only look at environmental considerations. We're trying to incorporate it all into the one framework. What we then wanted to do is quantify those risks, and they're being presented as a value at risk. So from the potential failure of a waste dump, we've got three risks being the failure size, potential impact to the operation, and impact on other waste storage capacities uh, at the same operation. On the ultimate pit size, we've got a residual resource risk and an excess stripping risk. And for better or worse at the moment, everything's presented as standard NPV, uh, along with the value at risk calculations are all standard NPV as well. 
Um, so just before we jump into the results, uh, what, what I would like you to have in mind as we go through it is the concept here is that we're trying to assess and quantify risk and, ident and quantify how they relate to value and then determine whether or not they have the potential to impact on the strategy that would be selected. Uh, so results, these are all based on the biggest, steepest dump design because it's the most dramatic. So it, it presents the, the risks more, more, um, in a more stark way. So let's first of all look at the um, value at risk of a dump failure. So this is a per tonnage basis. Now let me explain this chart very quickly. Uh, the x-axis is, is copper prices, but think of it as the ultimate pit size. So on the left, you've got a very small ultimate pit. And on the right, you've got a very, very big pit. Um, and, and also with that, the, the size of the dump changes. So you can see in the top left corner, there's a very low risk uh, because the probability of anything failing is low and the size of the failure is less. And that's transitioning. And, and this is all probabilistic. So all of the, the box and whiskers are presenting the underlying probabilistic data set. And you can see that as that dump gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, the risk or the value at risk is increasing until you get up to around that 350 to 400 million dollars of NPV impact. And once the dump's built to full size, that flattens off. This is a similar chart to the following chart. So just remember, small pit on the left, big pit on the right. Uh, our next risk is the potential impact to production at the operation and it has a similar trend. As, as the dump gets bigger, uh, it flattens off and that risk levels out. And it's a similar trend again with the impact on the other waste management facilities at the operation. You can see that that, that risk is increasing and then flattening off. Uh, now this is the this is a chart that's looking at the risks from um, resource utilisation essentially. So the blue bars on the left show the residual resource risk. So if you have a higher commodity price and a small pit, there's a potential that you'll have left valuable uh, valuable part of the resource still in the ground. Conversely, the orange bars on the right are showing the excess stripping risk. So you've selected a pit that's too big, and by the time you probabilistically consider uh, future price environments, it's it's too big, uh, you mine too much waste, and you don't actually access enough uh, contained metal to pay for that stripping. And the next chart, I'm going to join this into the one series. So there we go. The orange bar is that joined into the one series. So actually, if we go back for one second, what you would do here with this chart is if you're trying to select a minimum value at risk pit, you'd be targeting at about that uh, $2.20 mark for your pit. So that'd give you a minimum value at risk. You don't have to choose minimum value at risk, but if you did, that's where you'd be. And now if we go back to this chart, the orange uh, bars show just looking at the commodity price uh, probab probabilistic analysis, value at risk. Uh, and the blue bar now adds into that the risks associated with the waste dump and its potential to fail. Um, so if you're now picking a minimum value at risk uh, pit, you'd be down around $1.40, which is a, a pit that's about 60% of the size of the $2.20 pit. Now, if we look at all of our, so we've looked at six different dump design options, and you can see now that there's quite a range of different risk profiles within this. So the green and the yellow, uh, have a much lower risk profile and you'd end up selecting an ultimate pit in a similar place to where you would uh, otherwise. And then some of the larger dumps have a, have a significantly higher risk profile of something going wrong. So a couple of quick conclusions, probabilistic risk-based inputs for operational domain design impact on the expected outcome, which was the hypothesis at the start. The quantification of those risks therefore impact, impact on the expectation of value. And as a result of that, you can expect that strategy will be impacted also. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tara, Isaac, Eric, and Ed for those uh, updates. Look, uh, I, I know we're over time and we've gone into tea a little bit, um, but you can see there's been a lot of work going on in this program. And I encourage you to join the, the uh, working sessions after tea to help continue with this work uh, as we move forward. Thanks, and I, that closes this session.